The text for our sermon this morning comes from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians, chapters 3 and 4, beginning at verse 12. Therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. We are not like Moses, who would put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. But their minds were made dull, for to this day the same veil remains when the old covenant is read. It has not been removed, because only in Christ is it taken away. Even to this, but whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we who with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Therefore, since through God's mercy we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. Rather, we have renounced secret and shameful ways. We do not use deception, nor do we distort the word of God. On the contrary, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. I'd like to introduce you to our hero. Her name is Sarah. Sarah was a young girl. She dressed sort of the way that old farmers do. She wore overalls and had pigtails. I don't know why nobody else wears overalls except for old men and young girls, but I suppose that's just the way it is. So that's the way Sarah was dressed, just to give you an idea of what she looked like. Sarah was just an ordinary girl, but Today was a very exciting day for Sarah because she was at a rich kid's birthday party. Just about the best thing a young kid could ever be at. And Sarah's parents were there because she was so young, so they were there helping chaperone. And they gave her a pile of tokens. See, you see, at this, at this birthday party, they were at one of those little amusement park things where they were, they were rides and games and they were go-karts and bumper cars and laser tag and there was an arcade and face painting, there was all this wonderful stuff. And Sarah decided to to use her first token and she went on the bumper cars and she loved it. She loved the power that she had and smashing into the other kids and knocking them unconscious. She, She was really having a good time. And Sarah got off of the bumper cars and she said, that was so much fun, I'm gonna use all my tokens on that, that's all I'm gonna do the entire afternoon. But then her parents said to her, well Sarah, there's a lot of other fun things to do here. You could play mini golf, you could go to the arcade. There's a lot of stuff you can do here. Are you sure that you wanna do that? I mean, you haven't even tried the go-karts yet. And Sarah had to think, the bumper cars, are they the best thing or is something better coming? Sarah was now 16 years old and it was a big day for her. I mean, it was supposed to be a big day. It was her and her boyfriend's one month anniversary. She was in high school and unfortunately that day at school, her boyfriend did not wish her happy one month. He didn't text her in the morning. He didn't even talk with her at school, not even at her locker. He didn't give her a hug, didn't give her a note. And at lunch, he sat with another girl. So Sarah was upset and she went home and she was crying. And she wondered, I, 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 I don't know what's wrong with him. I know this is the boy I'm supposed to be with forever and ever. I, I just don't get what's happened. And her sister walked in and with sort of a roll of her eyes and a dismissive smirk, she said, just wait till you get to college. Then you'll actually date a real man. And Sarah had to wonder to herself, this boy that I'm with, is this the best that there ever could be or is something better coming later? Fast forward another several years. Sarah is now married. It's a very happy day for her. And she's just gotten out of the wedding ceremony and then there's that awful time in the middle when the people from the wedding party go to take pictures and everybody else just sort of has to wait. And there's no food served yet, and everybody's hungry, but they just have to wait for everyone to take pictures and then show up, and then you still have to wait because the food doesn't usually come out until like seven, and it's just awful. So that's, that's where we are. And being the bride, Sarah is hungry because people who are getting married don't really have time to eat because they have so much time they have to spend visiting and greeting people. 
But Sarah, you see, Sarah planned ahead. She's got a little packet of Ritz crackers, and she's about ready to go to town on those crackers. Until somebody says to her, Sarah, don't you want to wait for the food that you paid for, that you spent all that money on? Don't you want to wait for the wedding cake? I mean, you want to save room for that cake, don't you? It looks good. And then once again, Sarah had to ask herself that same question. Do I really want to eat all of these Ritz crackers? Is this the best that there ever will be? Or is something better coming later? Even though that seems silly, that's really the core idea behind this difficult lesson to understand. This lesson that's about Moses and his face glowing and veiling it and unveiling it and what what the point of it is. It's really about that same question. Is, Is this the best or is something better coming later? Moses had just finished talking with God when his face was glowing like that. But really, we have to go back a little bit. Moses had been up on a mountain with God. God gave him the Ten Commandments. Moses came down from the mountain, saw that the Israelites were already worshiping another god. And in anger, Moses took the tablets that God had given him and he threw them on the ground and they broke. And so Moses had to go back up and God had to write it down for him again. And Moses said, when I go up there, God, I want to see, I want to see you. I want to see your glory. And God said, well, you can't because you're just a person. The best you can do is see my back. But Moses was able to be there in the presence of God. And that's a big deal for a person. I mean, if we look elsewhere at scripture, we see people who were in the presence of God and realized it and thought, I'm going to die now. The prophet Isaiah, when he was starting out, he got to see God. And Isaiah thought, I'm, I'm done. This is it for me because I have unclean lips. I come from a people of unclean lips. Surely God's going to end my life. A couple weeks ago, we heard about Samson's mother and father, who, how they got to see God. And Samson's father, again, he said, my life is going to be over now because I'm just a sinful man. I've been in the presence of God. But Moses got to see him. And that's a big deal. Let's bring back Sarah, our hero. Imagine that after Sarah was married, she got a job. She was working for Microsoft. She was fixing people's phones when people couldn't get their email on it. So people would come in and talk with her, and she did whatever her supervisor told her to do. She came in to work when her supervisor told her to. She took lunch when her supervisor told her to. She pretty much did whatever the supervisor said. And then one day, here comes the store manager. This is a big deal. Even the supervisor is afraid of the store manager. So you can imagine how frightened Sarah would have been. And then one day, in comes the regional supervisor. This is an even bigger deal. And then one day, the national supervisor. And then finally, on a whim, Bill Gates decided to stop in. Bill Gates is so far up that chain above Sarah, he's like not even a real person almost. You can imagine she would be terrified to be in his presence and to mess up anything because she might get fired. But the difference between an average person to Bill Gates is nothing compared to the difference between a person and God. So for Moses to get to be in God's presence, it was a really, really big deal. And so when Moses came back down from the mountain, just being in the presence of God, not even seeing him face to face, but just being there, his face was glowing. And the people were upset. said, I, we can't be in God's presence. You were. We're afraid of what's going on. But they came back and Moses read them what God had given him. And then he veiled his face. Now, in a sense, he veiled his face because it was hard for them to look at it. And they were afraid, and they, were, they didn't know what was going on. But Paul tells us another reason that he covered up his face. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 13 says, Moses put a veil over his face to keep the Israelites from gazing at it while the radiance was fading away. At some point after Moses was, was there with God, the brightness that he had on his face would go away. And I'm not sure when he talks about Moses wearing a veil, if that meant he wore a veil pretty much the rest of his life when he wasn't talking to God or the people. Um, I'm not sure. 
That seems uncomfortable, but maybe that's what he did. But eventually that glow would go away. And Moses didn't want the people to look at it because they wouldn't understand what was going on. They didn't understand it when the glow was there. They wouldn't understand it when it was fading away. And he assumed, rightly, that they would come to the wrong conclusion. Unfortunately for all of his efforts, people still didn't get it. And Paul writes that whenever the old covenant is read, it's like the people have a veil over over their hearts. They don't understand. They took what Moses gave them, the Ten Commandments and all the laws of God, and they thought, this is the best thing that we are ever going to get. And so they worked their hardest to try and earn God's favor. The Old Covenant said, I will be your God, you will be my people, do everything that I command you, and I will not destroy you. And the people said, all right, we're going to do our hardest, we're going to do our best to try and keep all of God's laws. But they couldn't. They couldn't do it. Nobody can. A lot of people today who sit in the pews on a Sunday spend a lot of time trying to keep all of God's laws perfectly because they think that will put them in a a good place with God. But nobody can do that. Not even Moses. And Moses was certainly a little bit higher than us. Something better needed to come. Something that wasn't just reliant on our effort. Because none of us could keep the Old Covenant. Because the Old Covenant didn't say, keep my laws pretty well, and then you'll be my people. It was, keep my laws perfectly, and that I won't destroy you. And since all of us have broken God's laws, we need something better to come around. We can't put our hope in that covenant, or in ourselves keeping it, rather. We needed something better. We had to say, I hope something better is coming. And when Moses' face would fade after a while, the reason it would is the old covenant wouldn't last forever. Something better had to come. Someone better had to come. What if there was somebody like that? What if there was somebody who was allowed to be in the presence of God and, and didn't just have to look at his back, but could actually look at him face to face and not be terrified of what would happen? What if there was somebody who could be in the presence of God and then come back and speak to us and we wouldn't be afraid to hear what he had to say? We wouldn't be afraid afraid of seeing his face glowing. We wouldn't be afraid of seeing his glory. And it wouldn't just be the glory of God reflected on him. It would actually be his. That's who Jesus is. And on Transfiguration Sunday, the disciples got to see Jesus in that way for the first time. They got to see all the glory of Jesus And they weren't afraid to be in his presence. Because Jesus allows us to come near him. He has said, you come to me, and I'm going to make a new covenant with you. This is going to be the new covenant. I will be your God, and you will be my people, and I will atone for all of your sins, and I will make you new again. That's what Jesus promised. And that's what Jesus delivered. Jesus lived a perfect life his his entire time on earth, and then he died on the cross to take away all of your sins. You are forgiven for everything wrong that you have ever done. Not because you have kept the old covenant that God gave to his people, but because Jesus kept it for you and through the new covenant has forgiven you and has taken all of your sins away. And you can see him face to face. He doesn't have to cover that up. Now, because of the work of God, our hearts are unveiled. Paul says, whenever anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. The Holy Spirit has worked in your heart to create faith, to trust in Jesus as your Savior. He has done this working through God's Word, working through baptism, and through that work, he has uncovered your heart so that you could understand and know who Jesus is. It's not something that you and I could have done ourselves. We can't keep the old covenant by ourselves. We can't even know Jesus by ourselves. But the Holy Spirit has brought us to faith in Jesus. 
And then Paul says, therefore, therefore, since we have such a hope, we are very bold. Therefore, since we, since through God's mercy, we have this ministry, we do not lose heart. You don't have to wonder, is something better coming? God gave his Old Testament law, something better than that came. Is something better going to come than Jesus? We spend a lot of time talking about Jesus. We talk about it in our sermons, in our children's devotions, in most or all of our hymns. We talk about Jesus. Is something better coming? Is there some better way to do ministry? Is there some better way to reach out to your friends? Do we have to come up with a new slogan? Do we have to read a new book that somebody has written? Is somebody going to discover something brand new about God's word that nobody has known ever? And then we're going to put our trust in that instead. That's not going to happen. It won't. We already know the truth. And so Paul writes, by setting forth the truth plainly, we commend ourselves to every man's conscience. All we have to do is tell the truth. The truth is not something far off or something that's hard for us to discover. The truth is something that's very close. We can see Jesus with faces that are unveiled. We can see his glory, a glory that's not going to fade away, a glory that lasts forever because he is the one who was promised to come. He is one who is greater than Moses. He has been in God's presence, and he has come back to tell us about it, and he has taken all of your sins away. And you can see him, and we all can see him. And you don't have to worry if anything better is coming because it's not. He is the best. Our hero, Sarah, on the afternoon of the day that she got married, she was asking herself that question, should I eat all these Ritz crackers? Should I stuff my face and have to redo my makeup? That's what she was asking herself. Is this the best or is something better coming? And she remembered back to when she was a little girl visiting her grandparents. And her grandparents' house looked like a lot of grandparents' houses look. They had those weird vinyl chairs and that old, that old laminate countertop and they had a weird old oven that looked like it was from before World War II. But her grandparents were nice. Sarah was getting hungry and her nose told her that whatever in the oven was being cooked was no good. It was meatloaf and it was burnt and she didn't want to eat it. So Sarah thought quickly. She knew that in her grandma's freezer there was always a gallon of orange sherbet. And Sarah didn't know exactly what sherbet was. She had never seen it in a store before, but somehow her grandma always had it. And so she was trying to be sneaky. What's behind that door? What's in the freezer? I want to go exploring. And before that door could even be opened, her grandpa ruined her entire day with those words the children hate to hear, you can't have any ice cream right now because you'll spoil your appetite. So years later, on her wedding day, Sarah ate those crackers. She knew as an adult that even if she spoiled this appetite, another appetite was coming right, right along. And she was old enough to make her own decisions. And the Ritz crackers tasted wonderful. She had to decide whether or not something better was coming. But in terms of your faith, in terms of knowing what you trust in, in terms of the one you worship, the one that you come to hear about over and over again, is there anything better coming than Jesus? No. And you can see him with unveiled hearts. Amen.